There are many horrors facing humanity in the 41st millennium. Few though rival the physically nightmarish alien race known as the Tyranids, also known as the Great Devourer. Tyranids are a Xenos race best described as a bioformic ecosystem. All have genetically similar elements but regularly diverge and evolve. Unlike most races in the galaxy, the Tyranids have no social or ideological goal, their goal is survival. Collectively they form fleets of these bioforms known as hive fleets, or biomechanical structures known as hive ships. They move through systems stripping planets of biomatter like locusts, then using this collected matter they fuel their further evolution and expansion. This rapid development enables Tyranids to make astounding leaps in evolution that would take other species millions of years to complete. Tyranids share a powerful ability in that form of the hive mind. This enables them to share information, react and make large scale decisions near instantaneously from the masses of forms that make up their collective. They also have a common psychic bond known as the synapse. This enables them to move and coordinate with other Tyranids around them as if one greater organism. The behaviour likened more to the conscious and unconscious muscle contractions of a larger entity than actual individual behaviour. The reactive movement of flocks of birds causing a natural spatial shifting is not entirely unlike the way in which the Tyranid synapse behaves. This collective reactionary cooperation is especially important when you consider that Tyranids approach to warfare is simply often to overwhelm through weight of numbers, a tidal wave of seething, vicious, corrosive biomass. With numbers beyond estimation forming the Tyranid fleets, the hive mind is critically important, as the organisms sentient or otherwise who compromise the Tyranids would just return to a state of rapid disorder and survivalist instincts without some intrinsic link to keep them focused and organised. Unlike many species in the 41st millennium, the Tyranids are far from xenophobic, in fact they actively seek genetic transfer of material across species. They will absorb and utilise any useful genetic traits they discover in life forms or on worlds that they consume. This information will then be used to improve their effectiveness either in biomatter consumption and efficiency or combat. All Tyranids are produced from a single life form within the hive fleets known as the Norn Queen. Without this bioform they would be unable to continue to replenish their forces. Much like any life form that lives in a colony, the Queen is to be found at the centre where she is most difficult to reach and most well defended. She essentially not only reproduces but bioengineers the life forms in a Tyranid swarm. The Queens will also relay information to one another psychically through the hive mind and enable them to create better suited or more powerful life forms. They also transmit orders and information to the lesser entities. In order to continue reproduction of the Tyranid bioforms, the Norn Queens require a constant supply of biomass. And this is literally pumped from a planet that has been harvested by a Tyranid swarm back to their hive ships in orbit. Disgusting reclamation pools are formed on the planet's surface where all biomass is dissolved together, collectively. The Queen will then continually produce new Tyranid forms in a variety of ways from eggs to live birth, larvae or grown in amniotic sacs. Most forms produced though do require further nurture from a worker class who as with most colony life forms provide them with the nutrition and care needed until they can survive for themselves. In the case of Tyranids, this usually happens very quickly. The most significant encounters with the Tyranids have occurred relatively recently and in the scheme of things they are a fairly new threat having first been truly encountered around 745 in Millennium 41. But rumours and fragments of information can potentially trace their impacts to anything in the region of the 35th millennium or before. They're believed to have been attracted to the galaxy due to the Emperor's psychic beacon, the Astronomicon, which acts as a lighthouse for Imperial ships travelling the warp. Imperial navigators use it to calculate their courses through dangerous warp space. 
The first major incursion by the Tyranids was Hive Fleet Behemoth, which after causing catastrophic damage on countless worlds, was ultimately repelled by the Ultramarines chapter. But this battle was barely a victory, the losses so high they would take hundreds of years to replenish and recover from. These events gave a worrying glimpse to the Imperium of the power wielded and damage that could be inflicted from a Tyranid Hive Fleet. It's feared and suspected that much worse is even to come, and the Tyranids have really only begun to scout through the galaxy. Tyranid Hive Fleets and their subsequent tendrils move quickly through systems, consuming all biomatter, but they never enter the warp, nor do they possess actual faster than light technology in the standard sense. They instead use psychic powers of a specialised hive ship known as a narval, that manipulates gravity fields of any star system they are in to achieve faster than light travel. The Narval ships are more scouting than combat focused, and they use clusters of monofilaments to assess electromagnetic and gravimetric information. This enables them to detect the direction and location of new systems containing potential biomatter for the fleet. The details on how the Narval ships actually use this are not clear, but in essence what may happen here is the Narval somehow create a huge gravity well enabling the fleet to then move at speeds equivalent to fast and light tech as used by the Imperium. This huge distortion of gravity has a devastating impact though on inhabited planets in the system with the gravity well causing cores of planets to swell, creating subsequent earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions and any number of damaging consequences. The Tyranid fleet then essentially fall through this compression, allowing them to reach their destinations at immense speed. The physics of this are all pretty spurious, but not much more than anything else around this kind of travel. The one problem for Tyranids is that on arriving after travelling through the gravity well, they are then only capable of sub-light speeds, and so this can mean that they will still take many years or even decades to actually reach their final destination. If they're able to be detected in time, this window may give whatever worlds they're headed for time to prepare, evacuate or call for defensive reinforcements. The all-encompassing effect of the psychic hive mind of the Tyranids forms a phenomenon known as the Shadow in the Warp. This smothers and envelops whole star systems. Whenever a Tyranid fleet is near, this effect will become apparent as psychers will struggle to manifest their abilities, navigation and communication become nearly impossible. For the Imperium, this apparently ambient effect of the Tyranid race is especially devastating as they rely on psychic communications heavily. If a planet becomes enveloped by this effect, they will unlikely be able to call for help and are then left with the sobering prospect of facing the inevitable Tyranid swarm alone. The Imperium perceives the Tyranid fleets as separate forces competing with one another for resources, much like any other organism of the same species will compete with their own for resources. However, in reality, this is not the case. The Tyranids, through their hive mind, form a much more complex construction of organisms. Perhaps the most terrifying fact about the Tyranids, though, is their drone-like single focus. Much like any large predators looking into those black, black eyes, you know that they have no feelings about their actions, only that they know what they must do, and their instincts and synapse-led instructions from the hive mind tell them all they need to know. The strength of the hive mind and its localised area of effect will actually wax and wane, but it's strongest around some of the more significant bioforms like Tyranid warriors, hive tyrants, which will cause this amplification effect of the hive mind. Without these synaptic linchpins, many of the lesser Tyranid forms would actually revert to unfocused animalistic behaviours. But for that reason, there is no one commander within a Tyranid force most often, but multiple senior forms that secure the network work of the hive mind uniting and focusing the lesser forms. This synapse link bonds Tyranids together like an invisible rubber banding effect. The larger warriors and tyrants are capable of some level of decision making, although this is still relative to their role within the hive mind, and is much more reactionary or preemptively instinctual than actually tactical. With that said, they can learn and react from their enemy, which can again give the impression that they are actually reacting to that, but it's a more kind of genetic instinct. 
The whole thing is more a chorus of chaotic input that runs through specialized synapse entities who act as hubs to convey and facilitate the distribution and collection of this mass synaptic data. These creatures though are undoubtedly powerful psychic organisms and any psychic entity of power usually will attract attention from the dark beings who reside within the warp, and this has been established for a long time. But why is it then that the Tyranid psychers seem not to attract the nightmarish beings from within the warp when the opposite is true for almost all other races? It simply is a mystery. Tyranids use a unique method of construction to create their ships, weapons and general mechanical requirements. This means that they do not need to be concerned with locating metals or fabrication of plastics. Instead, as with everything, they utilise biomass collected from the worlds that they ravage. This biomass is then genetically engineered to grow the structures or components they require. This means that everything they use or inhabit is in essence a part of the Tyranid collective, down to the smallest glands or connective tissues right through to gargantuan bioengineered starships. The very worst of their creations are of course the combat focused entities. To a human they embody everything that is Xenos. They are literal nightmares made real. While they do possess ranged weapons, many Tyranid creatures are fighters and melee focused. A great deal of Tyranid weaponry are these creatures own teeth and claws, but simply bioengineered to appalling degrees of effectiveness. These claws will slice clean through all but the toughest armour and eviscerate their enemies in seconds. They also carry ranged bio cannons firing invasive venomous parasitic projectiles that will burrow into the flesh of their enemy being very much as unpleasant as it sounds. They usually also fire a good shower of acidic poison as well that will melt and dissolve through almost anything including the armour of a wearer in seconds. Suddenly, normal projectile weapons don't seem quite so bad. Often as well, Tyranids do not carry their weapons in the strictest sense, more they are usually fused extensions of their own bodies, creating an appalling parody of form. Some will have spines on their bodies that can also expel and impale their targets, pinning them in place or just dismembering them where they stand. Most Tyranid weapons conform to this formula of sharp implements or acidic spray. Some creatures though, like the Lictors, will fire tendrils with razor sharp hooks, pulling the hapless enemy into close range of its powerful claws, whereupon it would obviously be torn to pieces. Some Tyranid creatures like the Termagants will fire live creatures from their bioweapons. The Termagants Flesh Borer is one such weapon and, as the name implies, it fires beetles that unpleasantly bore through armour and into the flesh and beyond. Other weapons like the Shock Cannon fire sinews much like a taser and then electrocute their targets with bioelectric pulse energy. Another interesting weapon in the Tyranid arsenal are the Barbed Strangler Seed Pulse. Pods. These are fired out and then upon impact grow to maturity in seconds with barbed tendrils reaching out in all directions, trapping, strangling, eviscerating anything they come into contact with. Tyranids even have bio mines known as spore mines and these are automatically triggered when a non-Tyranid comes into close proximity. These mines are not embedded in the ground but rather float around after being deployed until they come near a target and activate. As with most mines, mechanical or otherwise, the detonation releases in spore mines a nasty cocktail of acid, toxic gas and chitin shrapnel with relative consequences to its target. Now Tyranids obviously do not wear armour in the normal sense, as with everything they have bioengineered reinforced carapaces or body shells. Larger organisms will also likely have strengthened exoskeletons. These armoured shells turn their wearer from bio-machine to bio-tank form. These shells are harder than Imperial Ceramite and only the heaviest anti-vehicle weaponry is going to be able to begin to scratch the surface. Smaller Tyranid forms will sport strengthened chitin and this is more akin to a tough hide than a bone-like carapace. This is the standard for the smaller more disposable organisms in a Tyranid swarm and will only really prevent melee attacks and small weapons fire. Anything more and its defensive abilities are actually going to be pretty limited. The larger creatures will though have a chitin covering a carapace. This can 
cover sections or all of the creature and is much more effective at protecting the tyranid organism that use this form of protection. On top of these natural defences and bioweapons, tyranids also have plenty of attributes, offensive and defensive, that they wield as part of their own bodies. Acid being pretty common among tyranids, with acidic jaws spitting venom that consumes and dissolves enemies in seconds. Chameleonic skin also allows some tyranids to stealthily blend into surroundings to launch ambush attacks on passing enemy. Enhanced neural senses enable tyranids to detect hidden enemy using tech to cover their appearance or location, and powerful leaping appendages allow them to fly into battle, crushing enemies in the process. Many have increased regenerative abilities that enable the fast healing of even catastrophically severe wounds. Some tyranids simply just possess very spiky and thorny carapaces, so when they charge into battle, any enemy not already physically crushed will be lacerated or impaled by the creature's own surrounding body armour. A thorax swarm is another particularly nasty contained weapon some tyranids feature. In their swollen chest cavities, many creatures are amassed, a bulging swarm of parasitic creatures. And when in proximity of the enemy, this thorax sac will just erupt in a huge burst, throwing the parasites hurtling towards and drowning the unwitting victims in thousands of these smaller, very aggressive tyranid forms. These will then proceed to crawl inside armour, down enemies' throats, and chew through eyes and exterior flesh. They will then emit either arcs of electricity, charring their victims, or suck all the moisture out of their body, desiccating them in seconds, or just climb in and around the bodies of the enemy, exploding with needles of chitin, literally bleeding them to death. In general, tyranid forms are sharp, acidic, and hazardous in general to your health. But it's not just the small life forms, the living ships themselves also have offensive and hazardous attributes. They will generally feature the common acidic weapons that will burn through the hull of enemy ships and ordnance that will actually burrow its way inside of enemy vessels to then launch smaller tyranids from these. Small or large, all tyranids are formed from the reconstituted biomatter of their unwilling victims. Spliced together and reformed in their own image, part of the horror is not simply that they will destroy you and everything you know, but that all of this and yourself will become tyranid in a horrific parody of form and evolution. The Tyranid's main means of acquiring new biomatter is, as previously mentioned, to secure a planet and then proceed to forcibly rape the land of all its life forms and resources, in usually a wholly unpleasant process. Let's see what that entails. Now firstly, the Tyranids will, for want of a better word, recon the world they intend to harvest. They will instigate initial stages of infection by deploying Tyranid species known as Lictors, also gene stealers and vanguard drone ships. These creatures focus mainly on concealment and stealth, but are undoubtedly still horrific and dangerous in their viciousness. They'll also unusually focus on staying alive, as opposed to in later full-blown assaults, which are much more like a tidal wave of tyranid form, literally clogging the enemy with acidic death. These species are also unusual compared to most main assault tyranid lifeforms because of their independence. They exhibit more self-awareness and more situational choices than the swarms that will likely follow. This has no doubt been decided as the most effective course of action and behaviour for these early scouting tyranids. The Vanguard drone ships are simply the transportation for these early scouts. They are small, independent ships and only will periodically return back to the main Hive Fleet vessels. Lictors are the masters of stealth. Using feeder tendrils, they analyse all the environmental elements and constituent biomatter that is available to them. They may also choose to kill and devour lifeforms to absorb their memories, as is one of the Tyranid traits. These memories may give them further relevant information or acquire locations to explore. Gene stealers, though, will not simply acquire biomatter intel, they will also begin the infection of the tyranid forms in the local ecosystem. This corruption will eventually result in the first tyranid hybrid creatures from the planet's native species being formed. Once these initial recon periods are complete, the tyranids will quickly switch their behaviour from somewhat passive investigation to full-on planetary infestation and excessive aggression. 
A psychic call emitted to the swarm will alter the fleet and subsequently pull the hive ship toward the planet. Any humanoids on said planet at this time would be advised to panic, because infestation will now begin. As the hive fleet draws near, it will, as previously stated, disrupt much if not all communication from the target planet and its inhabitants and they will now be cut off from the wider systems surrounding it, unable to call for help or give warnings to others. Any evacuations that can be made would probably be advised to do so, but even they may not escape with the high fleet monitoring movement in and around their target planet. Even if ships were sent to counter and defend a planet, they may not be able to actually exit into warp space because of the Tyranid's psychic effect, the shadow in the warp. And once arriving at the planet, mycetic spores are released into the atmosphere, raining down. And these spores seed the planet with microorganisms, which will alter and distort the planet's natural organic life forms. They'll also begin to break down complex organic molecules and alter them to be more suitable for absorption by the swarm. This first, as one of many unpleasant processes, can affect complex and simple life forms. Meanwhile, other spores will actually contain the more complex Tyranid life forms, and these will begin to group together, preparing to assault when commanded to do so. Others, though, will burrow underground, planting more spores that will then grow into capillary towers. These vast chitin towers raise up out of the ground and reach as high as the upper atmosphere. Reclamation pools will then appear near to them, linked via underground root systems. These towers will then later connect via the tubes from the hive ships to suck up biomatter from the planet. Capillary towers can grow almost anywhere, environmental conditions seem to not affect them. The reclamation pools are the unpleasant pools where all the planet's biomatter is gathered and broken down collectively. It's essentially a thick soup of dissolving life forms, both sentient and non, which the hive ships will then suck dry. But Tyranids will not just reap the organic surface of a planet, but also its underground mineral wealth. So this initial infestation phase will mean creatures underground begin seeking and mining out a planet's mineral wealth to again be dissolved and consumed by the swarm. As this is all happening, the concealed infiltrators, the lictors and gene stealers, will now emerge, bursting from their hidden positions around the planet to attack anything that they have deemed to be a vital defensive system from their intelligence collection efforts. They may target senior leaders, officers, critical infrastructure, all are going to be prime targets, and these attacks will also start to cause fear, panic, confusion from further hindering a planet's attempt to keep control of any kind of public order. Once the Tyranids have begun this initial phase, it will not be long before the more severe and far more aggressive assault will begin. These initial stages, while terrifying and unsettling, are just a pale taste of what's to come. Swarms of Tyranid forms will thunder across the planet, slaughtering anything native that stands in their way. All the small forms like the gene stealers and those seeded like gaunts, gargoyles, etc. are going to be present, but now also will come the bigger forms, carnifexes and hierophants, the true nightmare creatures. The capillary towers will also start to burst from the planet's surface as well reaching up into the skies and vast swathes of tyranids scouring the planet. The towers will start to begin the process of consuming biomatter because there is no standing on ceremony for victory. From the initial assault to the final exodus, the process of absorption and consuming biomatter will begin. The capillary towers themselves are far from inert systems, they'll actually throw out tendrils and tubules that can absorb life forms and native species. For more civilian planets, the Tyranids will usually just allow the gene stealers and gaunt genus to do most of the work. Termagants, though, will also make up this battle force, as will the Tyranid warriors, keeping the swarms coordinated and focused, relaying the hive mind among them. More heavily defended planets, however, are going to require more significant firepower, and the Tyranids unfortunately have this at their disposal in the form of Hierophants. These bio-titans are terrifying enemies, towering over the battlefield. They are some of the largest forms in the Tyranid arsenal, comparable in size to Imperial Titans. Armed with some of the largest biocannons in the Tyranid weaponry, a large electrochemical discharge spews corrosive maggots that upon impact of any structure or enemy will, in combination with a highly corroding acid, will burn, burrow and dissolve whatever they come into contact with, inevitably reducing it to a pool of dissolving, screaming, collapsed biomatter. 
It also is supported by heavy armoured chitin, as well as any number of blades and claws. Their own hide also exudes spores of poison, and its belly scattered with spined tendrils, lashing out and impaling any enemy who attempts to get close to it. It can, as with most Tyranids, also rapidly evolve, even on the battlefield, to adapt to whatever it might be faced with. These assaulting forces are mainly suppressive in their objective. They're not there to collect or break down biomaterial for the hive, they are there to crush resistance to the swarm. All materials will be later collected with ease. One of the most efficient elements of the Tyranid assault is that simply nothing is wasted. Death means very little to the Tyranid swarm because any deaths will simply just be reabsorbed into the biomatter pool and then later reconstituted. This high level of efficiency and minimal waste explains why the Tyranids are more than happy to win battles through sheer weight of numbers with apparently little to any downside. A worrying prospect to any force attempting to repel an enemy with no real appreciation for the horrors they're inflicting and certainly no moral compass of any kind, but then what does have a moral compass in the 41st millennium? They are unrelenting and nearly unstoppable, an irresistible force of violent evolutionary design. As with the orcs, a planet suffering from this level of infestation is in a critical state. Even if arriving defenders were able to somehow destroy the Hive Fleet's main ship, the existing Tyranids on the planet's surface will cause ongoing devastation for potentially millennia to come. Tyranid planetary infections occur at a microbial level, so truly eradicating them can be nearly impossible, short of full-scale exterminatus, which would somewhat defeat the point of trying to save a colony or planet in the first place, but as the Imperium, you're probably certainly keeping that option on the table. With much of the planet overrun with Tyranids and any defenders likely beginning to buckle if not already collapsing under the weight of nightmarish violence and body ruining acidic bioweaponry, the collection process for the planet's biomatter will now be well underway and the world now entering a downward spiral that it will struggle to if not already be unable to reverse. Worse still, if a battle is proving especially challenging and continuing, the Tyranids will then start to utilise biomatter on the surface to form new creatures and effectively use the planet against itself. Rippers will begin a swathe of foul consummation, sweeping across the surface and consuming and devouring all matter in their sight. Once these rippers have had their fill, they will proceed to the biopools around capillary towers. Yet instead of bringing up their consumed mass into the pool or depositing it by some other means of excretion, the rippers will shockingly throw themselves into the biopools to simply be dissolved and then consumed back into the biomass of the hive fleet. This disturbing act demonstrates how the Tyranids hold little to any regard for their own individual entities and view their form as a singular collective, a whole organism one and the same. New rippers will be continually produced until the planet's matter is exhausted. Ocean sea life, mineral wealth, surface fauna, it's all one and the same, will all be consumed. At this stage the planet is now far beyond any hope of rescue or redemption and is essentially doomed at this point in time. If the Imperium had the option to do so, this would be the point to perform exterminatus on the planet, but it's just as likely that they wouldn't actually be able to reach or assist the no doubt highly traumatised scraps of remaining humanoids hidden somewhere underground in deep bunkers. If no action is taken, they may survive by chance, but more likely will be dug down to and extracted by the nightmarish alien force. Still, not all hope is lost in the grand scheme of things. A defensive move is possible at this point and would actually be somewhat useful. It would be entirely possible that the Tyranids at this juncture may be at a point where they have to expend more biomatter than they are yet to have been able to consume, meaning they're actually at a net loss in terms of their overall collection of biomatter. So to launch an attack at this point would actually be tactically sound from a generally defensive point of view for other worlds in the system, and may even mean that the Tyranid threat can either be repelled, if not potentially defeated. The Tyranids' goal is always to gain more biomatter than they began an assault with to profit from each encounter, 
to leave with less matter than they arrived would certainly not demoralize them, they have no concept of such a thing, but it would potentially slow down their reproduction of forms and possibly even make further assaults more survivable for a planet. So even though a singular planet may well be completely lost, for the Imperium or whoever is fighting back against the High Fleet, there is a real purpose to still fight and try to mitigate whatever damage they have inflicted in a larger sense. And this is true of the wars and conflicts in the 41st millennium. They're often part of a larger picture, and so these efforts are not as pointless as they might appear to be. They could mean that future Tyranid assaults are successfully repelled before reaching a point of no return. Meanwhile though, Tyranid forms would be far from concerned with such grandiose concepts and instead be wholly focused on their task of extracting biomatter, an orgy of consummation continuing across the entire planet. After the capillary towers are spread across the surface, the oceans and below ground, life forms and resources are being reaped from the subdued world, the Tyranids will then begin the process of absorbing the accumulated biomatter to their hive ship. Tendrils are extended from the hive ship to connect with the capillary towers, which are now high in the atmosphere. And the biomatter from the pools around the capillary towers will now be pumped up to the ship. But now comes a most shocking twist to the story. Once all the planet's defensive forces are completely destroyed, even the surviving Tyranid forces will begin to throw themselves suicidally into the digestive biopools surrounding the capillary towers. They are immediately broken down by the highly acidic liquids and devoured by the hive ship. All genetic material is consumed, their matter, memories and innovations as part of this planet's assault. Once all the biomatter has been pumped to the ship, the towers will begin to draw the water itself from the planet. Then the capillary towers themselves will begin to break down and be reabsorbed by the hive ship. Lastly, and perhaps most shockingly of all, even the planet's atmosphere is consumed by the hive ship before the final capillary towers are reabsorbed. Some Imperium biologists speculate the hive ships using unseen processes transform the planet's atmosphere into a solid matter state. As the Tyranid fleets slowly begin to move away from the planet with their sub-light speed limitations, left behind is a barren, desert-like rock. A ravaged and destroyed world that will likely never see life on its surface again, nor any installations as all resources have been extracted. As the Hive fleet plan their next target, the time spent in between on the journey will be utilised in consolidating the information and new genetic profiles gathered from the last devouring. This may lead to the development of new bioforms or the improvement of existing ones, making the Tyranid either more combat effective or improving their harvesting efficiency. Because of the Tyranid's psychic force that often prevents ships from exiting the warp in a system under assault by a high fleet, as they leave it may be that this is when Imperial forces first learn a world has been destroyed and with the utmost urgency, warnings and emergency action will attempt to be executed at this point. But with no way of knowing their destination, Imperial forces will need to move swiftly if they are able to have any hope at all of repelling wherever the Tyranid threat next decide they wish to devour.